It also happens like in bank scenario, where the bank is the seller, the title company will mail the package to the bank sitting in Texas, and the bank will sit down with their closing agent, sign everything, will notarize it. They put it in an overnight envelope, FedEx it, and then when the buyer comes into the title company, the title company pulls the packet out, zip, opens the FedEx envelope, pulls the documents out, and goes, okay, now you sign. Bum, 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 bum. They give the buyer their copy. They make a copy, put it in a FedEx envelope, and ship it back to the bank sitting in Texas. Okay? So closing in escrow happens now because either they can't be there in a temporal sort of manner, same time, or they can't be there in a, sp a spatial different location. What you're seeing now, and I just heard about the other day, is now they're doing these curbside closings we talked about, like the uh, old uh, drive-ins, where buyers will sit in one car and sellers will sit in one car, and the title person comes out, whoop, whoop, and runs back and forth. <clears throat> I swear to God, I'm going tomorrow to one of these. If we do this, I'm also going to order a hot dog and a root beer when she comes to the window. I'm, I'm going to do, I'm telling you now. So if you read about an agent getting slapped, that's going to be me tomorrow because I'm going to sign the documents and go, oh, and by the way, can I have a Coney dog and a root beer? That's an old A&W joke for us that used to drive because that's what they're doing now, this curbside service. All right, so we got it face-to-face -face or in escrow. And I'm assuming this curbside thing they're doing now, I don't know, I would assume they consider it face-to-face -face because you can see the other client sitting in the car. Now, if they did it at different times sitting in the car, I would assume it would be work like an escrow. They would sign, title company would put it away, come back out for the sellers. So it's you gonna be- a, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You as an agent though, with escrow closing still will be with your, uh, your client? Yes. Okay. When you go to an escrow closing, let's say your buyer is buying a bank owned home. You would go with your buyer, and when you sit down on this side of the table, there is no one on that side because that's the bank who has already signed in Texas, so there's no seller on that side of the table. It's just your two buyers and you, and the title rep comes in and says, okay, you sign, and then I'll call you when the others sign. You still go. Now, the other agent that is listing the bank will not show up either because their client didn't show up. So that's the loophole in the Indiana law. You have to go to closing. Remember I said that was the Indiana rule. Unless your client doesn't go. If your client doesn't go, you don't go. So even though the bank is in Texas, They've got an Indiana listing agent. The bank is going to sign an escrow in Texas. When you go to close, that listing agent will not be there because their client's not there. Why would they go? All right. So you will sit on your side of the table, typically by yourself, and there's no one over there. All right. Even if you close an escrow because they can't come in till three, you still sit down at 9 a.m., there's no one over there. And then when they come in three, they're gonna sit over there and there'll be no one here. We have had scenarios before where husbands and wives could not be in the same room because of a court decree for, um, there was some spousal abuse. What's that called? A restraining order. So we actually had to put the husband in one room and the wife in the other room and the title person went back and forth to get them both to sign. And when the wife left, we literally asked the husband, just wait here. And you know, we watched her go out and get in her car and pull away, he, okay, you can leave. So we, we've had scenarios like that where they couldn't be in the same room, all right? 
So there's legislation that controls the closing. The biggest piece of legislation is this thing called RESPA, the Real Estate Settlement Procedure Act. And I told you this closing is called a settlement. So this is the act that governs how the closing happens. It is called RESPA. Now, RESPA, and remember the one we talked about the other day, TILA, the truth in lending, were the terms of the loan? Well, there's RESPA was a second document, and they have now integrated these two forms into one, and it's called TRID. And I showed you that the other day, but let's go show it again. What we used to have was the Truth and Lending Act document that required certain things about the lender being honest in their advertisements and things like that. Then we have this act that controls the settlement procedure called RESPA. So you have two documents. Well, the government in their infinite wisdom, remember we're from the government, we're here to help decided that they could reduce the paperwork of these two and integrate them into one disclosure. And what you have is this thing now we call TRID, which stands for the Truth in Lending Real Estate Settlement Procedure Integrated Disclosure. This combines these two disclosures into one. All right, but RESPA still uh, is still around and still involves the settlement procedure. First of all, let's talk about it. The first thing is RESPA is only for first lien residential properties. It deals with first lien purchases of residential properties. On page 263, there is a set of bullet points that I would suggest highly that you understand what RESPA does not cover. Doesn't cover large properties. Doesn't cover business loans. Doesn't cover commercial loans. Doesn't cover vacant land unless there is going to be a residential property built on it within the next two years. It doesn't cover transactions financed by a purchase money mortgage. Remember that? We talked about that. That is the loan made by the seller to the buyer at the closing table. That's the owner financing. RESPA doesn't cover owner financing. Now, RESPA has a whole bunch of rules. There are three that we really want to talk about. And they are called sections. The first one is called section eight. That's the first one we deal with. Section eight says, you cannot get paid a kickback for referring business to anybody on the settlement procedure or on the settlement form. So in other words, if you have a buyer and you tell the buyer, hey, call Colin Hedegaard, he'll do your loan for you. Colin cannot pay you for that lead. That violates RESPA rules. If Colin says, oh, you need an agent, call Raymond. I cannot pay Colin for that lead. You cannot pay a kickback. Now, there have been plenty of court cases already 
and you can try and call it whatever you want. Professional fee, fee splitting, commission, kickback, it doesn't matter. The government has won every one of those lawsuits. So no matter what you try and call it, you can't do it. You cannot pay anybody across the professional lines for a lead. Title company can't pay the realtor. Realtor can't pay the broker, mortgage broker. Mortgage broker can't pay the home inspector. None of this. Nobody can pay across the professional lines. Got that? Now, let me tell you this. We are the only profession that can pay inside of our professional lines. You wanna come here? No. <laughs> My wife brought me new coffee and I couldn't get her on camera. Thank you. We are the only profession that can pay a referral to another agent. That's a referral fee. We can do that. We're the only profession inside of our profession that can do that. Nobody can pay across the line. But mortgage brokers, for example, can't pay another mortgage broker a lead for a lead. Title companies can't pay another title company. We are the only profession a realtor can pay another realtor a referral fee, all right? So that's section eight, no kickbacks, you can't get paid. The theory is this, here's the theory on why this occurs. The theory is if Colin, if Colin had to pay me for a lead, at some point he would probably up his fees to cover that and the consumer would be paying for that without their knowledge. So that's why that has been outlawed, okay? Section nine, we touched on, and here's the rule. Section nine says a seller cannot force a buyer to use a company that the seller has already chosen. So if the seller pulls that title work the day they list it, under RESPA section nine, the buyer can choose whoever they want because the seller cannot force them to use a company they've already picked. All right, that would eliminate the buyer's free choice. Section 10 applies to buyers that are creating escrow accounts. When a buyer has to have an escrow account made for their taxes or their real estate insurance, remember the pity payment? They're keeping them in escrow. Well, you cannot open a bank account without money. So at the closing table, the lender will take money from the buyer to open these escrow accounts. This is always a confusion on the closing statement, and we're gonna to touch on it because the buyer sees this big number as their closing costs. 10 grand, as a mortgage guy, we've always gotta go, hold on, wait a minute. <clears throat> 3,000 of that dollars is actually your money, but it's being used to open these escrow accounts. Everybody get what I'm saying? The money in the bank is your money, even though you don't have it in your pocket, but you had to open that bank account somehow, so you went in and put $100 in it to open it. That's still your $100, you just don't have access to it in your pocket. That's what's happening here. So section 10 says that the banks have a limited number they can take. There's only a certain amount they can take from a buyer. Watch this. Years ago, banks were saying, 
All right, Christina, we're going to open you a escrow account. We don't know how much your taxes or insurance are, so we're going to take $5,000 from you. And in a month or so, when we figure out what the real number is, if you've overpaid, we'll send you money back. But during that month, guess who was collecting the interest on your $5,000? The bank was, because they were the one holding your money. That's not fair to you. So RESPA created this rule says, now the lender, and there's a mathematical formula that we're not going to cover, says I can, the lender can only take a given number and nothing more than that. All right. So they can't say, eh, give me seven grand and we'll pay it back if we're wrong. There is a mathematical formula that will calculate how much they can take to open an escrow account. So that's section eight, nine, and 10. No kickbacks. You can't force a buyer to use your company. And there's a certain formula to determine how much is needed to open, or the word they like to use is to seed, seed your escrow accounts.